All right, welcome back. In this lecture, we're going to talk about the concept of willingness to pay. We're also going to look at simulating uh, some market simulations. So both of these are things we're going to compute once we've already estimated a model. So once again, we start with a utility model. We have our observed utility and our error term. And the observed utility is just a sum product of different beta coefficients and the attributes associated with them. And we're interested in these coefficients because they tell us the relative value of each different attribute. And we obtain estimates of beta using maximum likelihood estimation, and we end up with a table, usually that looks like something like this, where each of these coefficients represent a mean, and there's some uncertainty about them that is represented by this standard error. Now these coefficients, beta, have units of utility. All right, and so what they're telling us is whenever we change an attribute, so for example, if x1 was price, and beta1 was some number like negative 0.1, then what that's telling us is every time we ch increase price, our utility goes down by 0.1. Now, that doesn't have any real direct meaning. It's kind of abstract. And one thing we can do to get a more concrete, directly interpretable result is compute willingness to pay. So I'll introduce this by separating the price attribute from all the other attributes that are non-price attributes. Okay, so by doing this, this coefficient alpha here, this is telling me for every change in price, my utility changes by alpha. So alpha is a direct conversion between utility and currency. And I can use this alpha term to convert all of these other non-price attribute coefficients from utility into currency. And so I compute willingness to pay by simply dividing this vector of beta coefficients by the price coefficient. So this is in vector notation, which represents a vector of each different beta coefficients uh, divided by the alpha, the, the price parameter. Now I have a negative sign in front of this because typically alpha is negative, which means when you increase price, my utility goes down. So by multiplying this by negative one, willingness to pay becomes a concept that's easily easier to understand. It says when you increase the value of x1, I'm willing to pay omega one. So a model specified this way is known as a preference space model. In this case, the coefficients we're interested in are the price parameter and all the other non-price parameters, and they have these units of utility. And so we can take the coefficients from this model and compute willingness to pay. Another way to get willingness to pay is to directly estimate it. In this case, we can make the substitution up front before we estimate a model, and then we can directly estimate the omega parameter here. Now, one of the main reasons I wrote the LogitR package was so that I could estimate models in the willingness to pay space. Another thing we can do once we've estimated a model is use those coefficients to make predictions about other markets. Remember that in a Logit model, the probability of any alternative being chosen is this fraction here where v sub j is just the observed utility, which is just this sum product. So if we already have our estimated coefficients, we can plug those in and compute the observed utility for a different market. Once we have all our different observed utilities for different alternatives, we can put them into this formula and compute market shares. So I'm gonna break down how we compute this fraction step by step. First thing we need to do is define a market. Typically, I arrange my market in a matrix like this, where each row is an alternative, and there are j number of alternatives. And each column is a attribute, and there are n attributes. In this case, each of these rows are an alternative that I might be interested in simulating. Now, sometimes these could be products that already exist, but they could also be products that may not exist, we can set up these markets however we want. Oftentimes, we'll use this to look at how my product might compare against a competitor product in the same market. Or we might be looking at different variations of my own product to look at which one would get the biggest market share. In R, we use the matrix function to assemble these matrices. And you have to include this C function, which stands for concatenate. Um, so you can write this all in one line where I write all these numbers within the brackets of this concatenate fu function. 
Uh, I like to type them in on different rows where each alternative is a different row. And so this is attribute one, this is attribute two, and this is attribute three. And these are the different alternatives. You have to tell the matrix function how many columns there are. So in this case, there's three. There's three different attributes. And finally, you have to use this by row equals true to tell it that you're going to read in these numbers from left to right, just like we read a book. Uh, if, you, if you had by row equals false, it would read it from top to bottom like this. Uh, and so that would populate the matrix incorrectly. Once we've got our matrix, we're going to compute our observed utility. So we have our vector of estimated coefficients, and we have this matrix of different products that we're interested in simulating, and the observed utility for each alternative is just a sum product where we take beta 1 times attribute 1 plus beta 2 times attribute 2 and so on. And we can do this for every alternative in our market. Now hand doing this one row at a time is a little slow and cumbersome, and so we can take advantage of some matrix multiplication techniques to speed this up. If you're not familiar with matrix multiplication, I recommend you go Google about it. In particular, the Wikipedia page is, is pretty good about it. Matrix multiplication is a linear algebra operation. Um, basically, all you're doing is, is saying for each row in this matrix, multiply it against this vector of betas. So it'd be x1 times beta1 plus x2 times beta2 and so on, and then do that for every row in the matrix. And so this single multiplication operation produces these vector of some products that we need, which is the different uh, observed utility values. Uh, in R, this is a single line of code. You can do matrix multiplication with just this one operation, percent star percent. And so with this one line of code, we can compute this whole vector of observed utility values. So it's our matrix X and then multiplied matrix multiplied times the coefficients from our model. Now keep in mind if you do this just a star and you leave the percent signs off, this is a different operation, so this will not produce the result we want. Next, we exponentiate our observed utility. This is a pretty straightforward thing to do. Once we compute our observed utility, we just raise e to the power of our observed utility. Uh, in R, you can use the exp function, uh, which exponentiates your value. Then we compute the denominator of this equation, and the denominator is just the summation of all of our e to the observed utility values. So that's the sum of this whole vector we've, we've just computed. In R, you can use the sum function to sum this up. And I'd save that as a new object called denom. Now we have all the pieces to compute the shares of our different alternatives in our market. And so to compute the probabilities, we just divide each of these values of e to the vj by the denominator. So for clarity here, I'm just going to summarize each of these steps back to back. First, we define a market, which I showed you how to do that earlier. Keep in mind that these beta coefficients are going to come from an estimated model. Then we compute the observed utility, which we can do with a single operation using matrix multiplication. We exponentiate the values from our observed utility. And then we compute the denominator of our fraction by summing these up. Finally, the probabilities is just these e to the vj over the denominator. So with just four different lines of code here, we can simulate the market shares of the different alternatives in our market. All right, let's do some practice questions. So let's suppose we estimate the following utility model, which describes preferences for cars. And the variables here are p, which stands for price in thousands of dollars, the XMPG is the fuel economy in miles per gallon. That's what MPG stands for. And the XELEC is a dummy variable that takes a value of 1 if the car is an electric car and 0 otherwise. So this is always going to be a 1 or a 0. Let's say we estimated a model and we got the following coefficients for alpha, beta 1, and beta 2. For part A, use the estimated coefficients to compute the willingness to pay for fuel economy and the electric car vehicle type. For B, use the estimated coefficients 
to compute market shares for the alternatives in the following market. Remember, each row is a different alternative, and each column here is an attribute. As a hint, look back at the code on the previous slide to figure out how to implement this in R. So far, we've only looked at point estimates of willingness to pay and market shares. But if you remember from the video on uncertainty, we talked about how we could use simulation to generate draws of our model coefficients that reflect the uncertainty in the estimated parameters. So just as a refresher, recall the example I showed before where you had some coefficients and a Hessian matrix that resulted from estimating a model via maximum likelihood estimation. Well, I compute this covariance matrix by taking the negative inverse of the Hessian, and in R, we use the solve function to invert a matrix. And then I can take 10,000 draws from that multivariate distribution by using the MVR norm function. MVR norm comes from the mass library, and it takes a vector of means and a covariance matrix. If I were to look at the first six rows of my draws, I can see that for each of these attributes, I've got a bunch of different possible values, right? So for price, my mean estimate is negative 0.7, and you can see that the draws for price are all just around that value. And the same is true for MPG and ELEC. Now once we've got all these draws, we can use these draws to compute different values. So before I showed you how to compute the mean willingness to pay by just dividing our vector of betas by the price coefficient. In this case, if we want to include uncertainty, we have to do the same thing for every draw of betas. So here, the superscript 1 is representing the first draw. So my omega 1, my willingness to pay for the first draw, is this vector here, where I've taken beta 1 over the price parameter, and beta 2 over the price parameter, and so on. And I do the same for every draw in that matrix. In R, this can be done with just a single line of code. Remember, the first column in my draws is the price coefficient. And so I can take the other two columns and divide it by the price coefficient, and then multiply that times negative 1, and that gives me willingness to pay. If I look at the first six rows of that, you'll see that I have a lot of different values of willingness to pay for MPG and ELEC. Once I've got these different 10,000 draws, I can use them to compute statistics. So, for example, let's say we just want to look at the fuel economy. Well, that's the first column of this willingness to pay matrix I have. So I can compute the mean willingness to pay by taking the mean of all of these draws, which is 0.142, and I can also look at the standard deviation of 0.05. I can also use the quantile function to estimate a 95% confidence interval around my willingness to pay. So remember, since in this case price is in thousands of dollars, this is saying for every one mile per gallon increase in fuel economy, my average willingness to pay is $142. But the confidence interval around that goes all the way from $36 up to about $250. So that's a pretty wide band of uncertainty. We can use the same draws of our coefficients for beta to also consider uncertainty around our market share predictions. Before I showed you how to compute the mean shares, by just evaluating the loaded fraction. But to include uncertainty, we have to compute this fraction for every different draw of beta. So just like we just did with willingness to pay, we can compute our probability piece of j using the first set of draws, and then do the same thing for the second set of draws, and so on, all the way through the last set of draws, where uppercase n represents the number of draws. Now this gets a little more complicated to do in R, and in practice, what we usually do is use the predict function from the LogitR package, uh, and we take the model that we estimated and give it a new data set of the set of alternatives we want to make predictions for. Um, and then that function will internally do exactly what I just said. It'll take draws of all the coefficients, compute these uh, market shares, and give you back a uh, set of probabilities of choosing each alternative and if you use the CI um, argument, you can also get lower and upper bounds for those predictions. So let's do some more practice questions using simulation. So suppose we estimate the same utility model as in the previous practice question, and the estimated model produces the following coefficients along with this Hessian matrix at the solution. For part A, generate 10,000 draws of the model coefficients using these estimated coefficients and the Hessian.
You can use the mvrnorm function from the mass library to do this. For part B, use these draws to compute the mean willingness to pay and a 95% confidence interval around the willingness to pay for fuel economy and the electric car vehicle type. 